I invite you to turn your Bibles to the Gospel of John. We're going to be in John chapter 10, finishing up what I started about two weeks ago. And if you don't have a Bible, you can always find one in your pew racks in front of you. Uh, if you don't have a Bible, that is yours to keep. That's our gift to you. We'd love to take I'd love for you to take that home and, uh, and read it. And so as we go to God's Word here shortly. In 1801, at age 30, Beethoven, the famous composer, of course, began to lose his sense of hearing. You would think for an all-world composer like that, that would be a real problem. In fact, it was a real problem. He got incredibly frustrated at this. Uh, we're told that even by the time he came to his mid-40s, he had pretty much all but lost his hearing. He would bang so hard on pianos that they would eventually have to be replaced in order to uh, feel the music. He held a pencil in his mouth and was able to feel the vibrations so that he might come to understand a little bit better the music. But what was really interesting in the life of Beethoven, he wrote his best symphonies and his best music later on in his life. In fact, many of you, of course, know the, the Ninth Symphony, uh, and that was written later on in Beethoven's life when he was pretty much completely deaf. And, and you might ask yourself, well, why? What was the cause of some of that? Well, we can only speculate, but it's very likely that for Beethoven, he began to tune out some of the voices and some of the other sounds that were coming in him, and he was able to listen and to hear in a very specific way the music that he was writing. So how do we do that today? Well, how do we listen? Well, we're going to go to God's Word. We're going to try to tune out some of the other voices that we hear in our culture. And we're going to look at a very particular and very significant passage of Scripture which teaches us who Jesus is. And, and there are many other voices in our world today that would seek to crowd out what Jesus has said. And Jesus specifically says in John chapter 10, verse 30, I and the Father are one. So before we look at the passage of Scripture, it might be worth just asking the question, how are evangelicals today hearing God's Word and hearing the voice of Jesus in their appropriation for understanding what it is He said and understanding their doctrine and their theology? And newsflash, we're not doing so well as an American church. You might be familiar with the statistics that were published by Ligonier Ministries in conjunction with Lifeway Research in the 2022 State of Theology. And what they did is they canvassed and they actually uh, researched and surveyed evangelicals, born again, saved evangelicals, at least those that would profess salvation in Christ and in Christ alone. So if you're kind of getting a picture for who these people are that took this survey, it's the people in our room today. And, and how did people respond to very, very simple, but also extremely important theological constructs? Well, listen to some of these statistics. Jesus isn't the only way to God. A whopping 56% of evangelical respondents affirm that God accepts the worship of all religions. Whopping 56%. This is what we're going to be really looking at and keying on today. But 73% agreed with the statement that Jesus is the first and greatest being created by God. That's almost three-fourths of born-again evangelicals. That is heresy in the highest order. 43% affirm that Jesus is not God. They would say that he was a great teacher, but he wasn't God. An amazing group of people, 60% of evangelicals responded that the Holy Spirit is a force and not a personal being. 57% also agreed with the statement, quote, everyone sins a little, but most people are good by nature. I mean, if you've been reading the Gospel of John, you would have problems with all five of those categories. And in total sincerity and seriousness, we need to ask the question and, and answer the question, let Jesus answer the question for us, what do we need to listen to? Who do we need to listen to? Maybe we need to tune out some of the voices and ask the question of Jesus and God's word, what does oneness really mean with the Father when Jesus says, I and the Father are one? Before we look at this second half of chapter 10, I, I want to just kind of paint the picture and context for you. 
Uh, We're told here in chapter 10 that Jesus is in Jerusalem during what's called the Feast of Dedication. And you can read your Old Testament for a long time and you'll never find reference to the Feast of Dedication. And the reason why is because the Feast of Dedication was a relatively new feast that the Jewish people adopted. You might know the story about Antiochus Epiphanes who came in and made a mess of things and brought all kinds of problems, you know, into that region of Jerusalem and Israel and actually set up heretical things and blasphemous things in the temple. And it was Judas Maccabeus, who sometimes is called the hammer, who uh, led a revolt against Antiochus Epiphanes, the Syrian, and ridded the temple of all of this garbage And on the 25th of Kislev, which is roughly pretty close to Christmas for us, uh, they rededicated the temple. And in the rededication of the temple, they uh, instructed everybody to light all of these lights. And that's why when you have Hanukkah or uh, uh, today, you have all of these different lights and menorahs and that sort of thing. It is an observation of what happened about 150 years prior to Jesus speaking these words. And so as, as Jesus is teaching here in Jerusalem, he, he does it with the backdrop of the temple being the light of the world. And he's already said in John chapter 2 that he, in fact, is the new temple. And he, in fact, is the light of the world. So all of these themes are kind of coming together. There's also an interesting part of the Gospel of John in chapter 10 that we have kind of a closure of a moment in Jesus' ministry where Jesus is kind of coming against and redefining the Jewish festivals and religious uh, ideology. And, and we've seen it really beginning from chapter 5 with the Sabbath and all the different festivals and feasts that Jesus came to Jerusalem for. He's redefining for them that all of these festivals and feasts that you observe ultimately point to me, Jesus would say. So all that is in the background. We're going to spend the bulk of our time in Jesus' words here in 22 to 30. And so read with me here, and we see here that Jesus gives a statement of harmony with the Father. In verse 22, at that time, the feast of dedication took place at Jerusalem. And a key point here, it was winter, and Jesus was walking in the temple in the colonnade of Solomon. So the Jews gathered around him and said to him, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. And Jesus answered them, I told you and you do not believe. The words that I do or the works that I do in my father's name bear witness about me. But you do not believe because you are not among my sheep. My sheep hear my voice and I know them. And they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. And here he says that I and the Father are one. Again, John tells us that the series of events here takes place during the Feast of Dedication, but he also tells us here that it was winter in verse 22. And that might just be a chronological marker for us to kind of mark some of the things in Jesus' ministry, but it's very likely also a theological statement. And here, darkness is descending upon the nation, if you will. And the lights are going out, and we are only about three months away from the crucifixion of Jesus. So it's very likely that John wants us to think literally that the darkness is descending. And that is increasing all the more with the antagonism and the anger that we see from the Jewish authorities and representatives. John also tells us that he's located in the portico of Solomon. That that is not just a geographical detail. It it is a a detail that is only given by an eyewitness account. But it's also interesting. It's located on the east side of the Temple Mount. And it was there often that rabbis and different teachers would give lectures to students. And it would be a place of intellectual discourse. So you can understand why Jesus is teaching there. Now, Some of the things that he says here are really interesting, but it is brought to a head with the question in verse 24, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Now, that sounds like a legitimate, sincere question, but if you've been reading the Gospel of John with us this last few months, 
You know better. And the way that's worded in the Greek, it can also be taken this way. How long will you keep annoying us? <laughs> How long will you keep badgering us? And what they're looking for is a smoking gun, if you will, to hang them on. Uh, there's enough hostility at this point that has increased, and they're getting increasingly more and more belligerent towards Jesus. And they're looking for a theological point to nail them on. And here they are. They're going to find it right here from the lips of Jesus and their estimation. And so what does Jesus do? He says, I've already told you and I've pointed to my works. And the works in the Gospel of John, as we've seen, we've called our series Signs from God. And the reason why is because we have direct signs or works from Jesus that point us to the reality of who he is. They're the miracle accounts. So we've seen a few of these. We've seen the miracle that the wine or the water turned into wine at Cana, the healing of the official son, the healing of the uh, man born blind in chapter 9. These are all significant signs that point to a greater reality of who Jesus is. So Jesus points to those works as testimonies. And he also points to the works that he performed and did through the power empowerment of the Spirit and in the Father. And so they're not listening. And so he says, I've already told you. Now, what he also says, though, is one of the greatest comforts that any of us can hear today, and it's the comfort of our eternal security. And the way he says this is profound. Look again at verse 27. My sheep hear my voice. That calls us back to him being the good shepherd that he told us two weeks ago. My sheep hear my voice. I know them. They follow me. And who is it that gives eternal life? Jesus says, I give them eternal life. It's a direct statement of his deity. And they will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. There are several ways in the Greek language to negate something. Just like we would use the word no or not in our language. Here Jesus picks the strongest negation possible. It's what's called the ume construction. And, and if I could just paraphrase it this way, Jesus says, you are my sheep if you know my voice. I know you, I call you, you follow me, and I have you as it were in the palm of my hand. And there is not a single thing in this universe that can pluck you out of my hand. You will never, ever, 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 ever perish. Why? Because he has the authority to give eternal life. Why? He is the good shepherd. How do we know he's good? He lays down his life on his own initiative for his sheep. That is absolutely profound. And so, if you're sitting here today and you're wrestling with your eternal security, Maybe some of you are getting closer to death. Maybe some of you are getting older and you're thinking these thoughts. And at the end of the night, when you lay your head down on the pillow, you wonder, how much longer do I have on this earth? Will God somehow find me acceptable? No one can pluck you out of Jesus' hand. Rest in that, church. Rest in that in comfort. But Jesus does something that is profound. He repeats himself in verse 29. Notice what he says, but he changes the words. He says, my father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my father's hand. So Jesus says the hand of the father and my hand are effectively one and the same in purpose and ability. That I am your good shepherd. If you are my sheep and you know my voice, I hold you. And oh, it's not just me, but the Father holds you. You have the greatest security imaginable. There is nothing on this planet that will take you from the Father's hand. Because Jesus says in verse 30, paragmatically, he says, I and the Father are one. I and the Father are one. In order to really understand what Jesus is saying here, we probably need to first take into consideration what he's not saying. 
Now, in the English language, we might be tempted to take it this way. We would hear the word one, and we would immediately think of one, two, three, four. We would immediately think of numerical qualities. And so we might be tempted to hear what Jesus is saying, I and the Father are one being. There are some real problems with that, as we'll get to in just a moment. But grammatically, there are also problems with that, because Jesus uses, in the Greek language here, Not the masculine form of the word one, but the neuter form of the word none. Just as in Spanish or in other languages in Latin, like you have masculine and feminine, but you also have neuter. And Jesus is kind of saying it this way, I and the Father are one purpose. We're not one being. We're not saying that, he's not saying that Jesus and God are like the same purpose person wearing a different hat or something of that effect. And so what do we mean, or what does Jesus mean by I and the Father are one? Well, it's one in purpose. It is oneness in their will. There is direct alignment in whatever the Father wants, the Son wants. There's no competition between the two. They are in direct alignment. It's like wheels on a car that are in perfect alignment. There's no pulling to the right or to the left. They are one in their will. They are one in their voice. And so Jesus says, as the Father calls, so also I call. And those two are effectively one in the same. They are one in their ability, Jesus says. So as I hold the sheep, so also the Father holds the the sheep. And his grasp is tight, and my grasp is tight, and together it's unbreakable. We have one definitive ability because we are both God. And that we are one in essence is what Jesus is saying. We are one in essence. And we get this primarily from church history as we consider how the church historically has come to understand this. Now, you might hold your finger here and turn over to chapter 17, verse 22. This is during the high priestly prayer of Jesus, and Jesus says something here also that is incredibly intriguing, but very similar to what he says here. In verse 22, chapter 17, the glory, speaking to God the Father, that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one, even as we are one. And so what Jesus prays for the church is that our voice and our will, not our ability, But our declaration would be in alignment and also our relational engagement with God the Father and Jesus the Son would be identical as Jesus' relational engagement and love and submission to the Father. That's a huge prayer. (laughs) I mean, that's, that's not, I'm praying for grandma's toe. That is a massive, massive and also incredibly comforting prayer. And so what we need to understand, though, is that what Jesus says in chapter 10, verse 30, is not just, though, that he and the Father have the same desires. He is pointing to something way more significant and that he and the Father share a divine essence. And so throughout church history, we've had these fence garters in our mind erected by the church for good reason and reflection on what the gospel of John says and what Jesus says here. But here are three crucial axioms that we must submit to. Number one, we believe in one God. We are monotheists to the core. We do not believe in three gods. We don't, do not believe in two. We believe in one God. Number two, we believe in three persons, three distinct persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And number three, enigmatically, we believe that each person shares the divine essence or each person is God. So the Holy Spirit is God. Jesus, the Son, is God. The Father is God. That's called Trinitarian theology. Now, let me kind of walk you through a little bit of church history and theology just for the next few minutes to show you how this was often misunderstood in the first few centuries of the church. And so we find some competing ideas and thoughts that were railed against orthodoxy. And I'm going to try to show you why these ultimately matter. But the first one is that what is often called Arianism. Arianism is named after a man named Arius, and Arius, whether he said it or not, it's often attributed to him, was famous for saying there was a time that the sun was not. 
Now, if you've ever had a knock on your door from the Jehovah's Witnesses, they believe in an Arian doctrine or an Arianism. They believe that Jesus had a definitive beginning. The Son of God had a definitive beginning because they want to preserve monotheism, but they have all kinds of other things in their theology that are wrong. But it views here that the Son of God has a distinct beginning. Now, Arius was an instigator of this heresy. And the church in 325 AD in the Council of Nicaea, shortly after Constantine legalized Christianity and made Christianity the official religion of the Roman Empire, called a council together, and the council holistically, almost unanimously, with one exception, Arius, committed uh, and said that anything representing the doctrines or heresies of Arius is in fact heresy. The sun has no beginning. Because if he had a beginning, he would no longer be God. Number two, another heresy that was floated in the early church is what is often called adoptionism. And and what this means and what this has kind of come to understand is that Jesus was a man just like you and me, but there was a time in his life and a time in his ministry, very likely his public baptism, where God adopted him as the son. And some of this gets really grotesque in the, what's called the Gnostic writings, and so much so to where uh, Jesus, as he was hanging on the cross, God the Father released the adoption of him. And, and so that, of course, is a grotesque understanding of true Christology, of who Christ is. Another heresy is this what's called oftentimes subordinationalism. I know these are big words, but they are simple concepts. And the idea here is that we have one big God up here and kind of one little God down here, and it's Jesus. And so if you've got a big God and maybe a little God down here, how does this work together? Well, we need to understand something, and we see that Jesus often says, I submit to the will of the Father. In fact, you remember in the Garden of Gethsemane, not my will, but your will be done. But his submission does not in any way imply or demand a lesser of essence. It was not a weak man that went to the cross, but when I do weddings, I always say it was a very strong man that went to the cross. And so when we talk about Jesus' submission, we're not saying that he was submissive to the point that he was somehow a lesser being. I and the Father are one, Jesus says. Another view was called tritheism. That's exactly what it sounds like. It's the idea that we have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And rather than being monotheist, we're going to be tritheist because we can't quite understand how somehow they share a divine essence together. So we'll say that the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Spirit is God, and they are all three gods in perpetual community together, but they also are in uh, conflict together somehow. They are wrestling maybe with each other for the authority of, of ruling the universe, something to that effect. The one, though, that is the most common that still exists, I believe, in the church today is that's what's called modalism. Now, if you've ever taught a children's Sunday school, I'm going to pick on you a little bit, and you've said something to the effect, the Trinity is like an egg, You've got the shell, you've got the egg yolk, and you've got the egg white. Let me just say you're a heretic. (laughs) And I mean that very pastorally, but I also mean that very seriously. What modalism simply teaches is that the Father acted in the Old Testament, Jesus then acts in the Gospels, and the Holy Spirit acts in the church, and they are modes of different states of being. And you say, well, you know, what's the big deal of that? Well, let me kind of point a few real problems out to you. Who in the world did Jesus pray to in the Garden of Gethsemane if we're modalists? He's a schizophrenic. Oh, I'm serious. It would be like, you know, if you had a 50th anniversary, wedding anniversary, and you called everybody to the party, and you're really, really excited and uh, your kids are throwing this party perhaps for you, and you stand in front of everybody and say, Martha and I want to thank you so much for being here. And everybody gets a little embarrassed because, you know, Grandpa's kind of off of his meds for a little bit, and Martha really doesn't exist. That's what modalism is. It's heretical. Now, let me kind of come back to this and come back to the Word of God and depart from church history and show you why this is absolutely critical that we don't affirm these false teachings. Jesus says, I and the Father are one here, but Jesus has consistently pointed to his own divinity. 
with the I am statements. Remember he says that before Abraham was born, I am. He directly points himself back to the burning bush account in Exodus chapter 3. And it wasn't just Jesus, it was John in the prologue. In the beginning was God, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jesus affirms his own deity. And so historically, the church has summarized it this way. And listen to some of the language of the Nicene Creed. This is from 381. Uh, The Nicene Creed was written in 325. There were other adaptions made, and this is the longer version. But the church has historically said it this way. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made one in being with the Father. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he was born of the Virgin Mary and became truly man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered, died, and was buried. And on the third day, he rose again in fulfillment of the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead. And his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and Son, who with the Father and Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism, we sang this, for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Those words act as a fence around our thinking to keep us from becoming modalists or tritheists or subordinationalists or Aryan in our thinking and our understanding. Those words have power. Those words have formative power. And so I want you to know those words, but I also want you to know why does this ultimately matter? It's just this theological hair splitting. Well, let me offer a few points and then we'll move on. At the very heart of the Christian faith is answering the question, who is God? And Any deviation from a biblical understanding of who is God outside of a a Trinitarian understanding of God, you will deviate eventually outside of the boundaries of the Christian faith. I had a seminary professor, it was rather profound, but he used to say this, if you're not Trinitarian, you're not Christian. I don't know what you are, but you're not Christian. You say, well, that's kind of harsh. Well, why? Well, let me ask you another question. Who was it that took your place? If Jesus is somehow lesser than God, if he is somehow a created being, how in the world did his atonement on the cross have any merit for you? Was he not more than just a mere example? And that is crippling for you. Because then the gospel is not what God did for you, but maybe what you can do for God. And you can follow in the examples of a really good teacher named Jesus, and you can show the world how God sees sin, and you can follow in his example. That's nonsense, and that's crippling to you. What you desperately need is God in the flesh to stand in your place. And to take the wrath for himself as your substitute, as a real human being, that's what you need. And mysteriously and gloriously, that's what Jesus has done for you. That's why he's the good shepherd. He lays his life down for you. Jesus says, I and the Father are one. If that's not a true statement, Jesus is lying to you. How can you trust him in his divine claims? How can you trust him in his truth claims? How can you trust him at all as your savior anymore? He has to be one with the father. He told us that. How can you relate to God? God in himself, in his essence, is a relational being, forever existing as a trinity, the father and the son and the Holy Spirit, always enjoying perfect fellowship and communion for all of eternity. He has demonstrated for us what it means to live in the context of love and submission. Do so likewise. For as I and the father are one, Jesus has prayed, so also we pray that you, church, would be one 
with Christ as well, that you would enjoy this kind of relational love. He demonstrates it for us in the Godhead, what that looks like. These are profound, gigantic thoughts, and they demand reflection, and they demand understanding, and you would understand then why the church for centuries has wrestled with this language. But ultimately, what we come down to are those affirmations that indeed we believe in one God. We believe that the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit share the divine essence, and they are three distinct persons. Well, I'm running out of time, but let me read to you kind of really quickly what happens. You think, well, I didn't understand a word that John just said. Well, they understood clearly what Jesus was saying. And in verse 31, the Jews picked up stones again to stone him. And Jesus answered them, I have shown you many good works from the Father. For which of them are you going to stone me? And the, Jew, and the Jews answered him, not for a good work that we are going to stone you for, but for blasphemy, because you, being a man, make yourself God. Jesus answered them enigmatically again, is it not written in your law? From Psalm 82, verse 6, I said that you are gods. If he called them gods to whom the word of God came and the scripture cannot be broken, do you say of him whom the Father consecrated and sent into the world, you are blaspheming because I said, I am the son of God? If I am not doing the works of my Father, then do not believe me. But if I do them, even though you do not believe me, believe the works that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I am in the Father. And listen to how they respond. Again, they sought to arrest him, but he escaped their hands. They are seething in hostility. And they understand exactly what Jesus is claiming to be. He's claiming to be the divine Son of God. And they say, I'm going to plug my ears and I'm going to shout at the top of my lungs because that is blasphemy in the highest order and I'm going to take your life, Jesus, and I'm going to do so right now. They understood exactly what Jesus was saying. Now, I don't have a whole lot of time to get into it, but Jesus quotes from Psalm 82 here. And one of the rabbinic traditions here was in Psalm 82 is that those that were Israelites were positioned to be sons of God in this sort, that they were priests to the rest of the world, that all the rest of the nations, pagan nations would come to Israel and Israel would mediate on their behalf as a kingdom of priests. We see at Sinai in Exodus 19, and then they would then rule and represent in that way. The problem is that Rome is exercising tyranny right now. And that was a perpetual pattern in the history of Israel that pagan nations would come and usurp that authority that the Israelites had via covenant. And Jesus here quotes, kind of plays on their own turf and plays in their own game. And he says, here's the problem, okay? The scriptures cannot be broken. You, Israel, were positioned to be sons of God. You failed because you're thieves and liars. I am the son of God. I am the one that has that kind of authority And then they pick up rocks to stone him. And listen to what Jesus does here in the very end of chapter 10. A curtain falls on the gospel here. It says, he went away again across the Jordan to the place where John had been baptizing at first. And he remained. And many came to him. And they said, John did no sign, but everything that John said about this man was true. And many believed in him there. And Jesus will retreat strategically for the next three months before he enters into Jerusalem riding on a donkey during Palm Sunday. And why does he do that? The reason why is because all the pieces politically and theologically are being arranged, but also he's setting the table for next week's great miracle of the raising of Lazarus, showing us that he indeed is the resurrection and the life. I want to conclude with a story and then we're done. It was in 1958, I read the story about a U.S. soldier who was wandering around in the streets of Berlin. And at this point, Germany had begun to rebuild from the aftermath of World War II, but there were all kinds of things, you know, evidences of the war that had taken place and all kinds of pieces of rubble and buildings and decay and that sort of thing. And he walked upon a scene and there was a big doorway. And the doorway was the only thing that existed from a church at the time. And on the door frame of the door, above the door, it said this, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. 
And on the other side of that doorway was what used to be rubble. They had cleaned up the place and kind of turned it into like a public park of that sort. And the soldier walked through that doorway, imagining that he was entering into the doors of worship. And it's a good reminder for us, who is the door? It's Christ. If you want to enjoy the relational love that the Father has for the Son, there's one way in, and it's through Christ. It's not through your works. It's not through your effort. It's not through your scripture memorization. It's not through your church attendance. It's not through your prayer life. It's not through your devotional life. It's not through any of that. It's through Christ performing those works for you, being the door, inviting you to walk through and enter into eternal life. And my friend, that door will never go away. But you've got one chance. Maybe that's your chance right now in this life to walk through that door into eternal life. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you, God, for the integrity of your word. It is spellbinding. It is hard to understand. It's difficult, but it's true, and we affirm it. Father, we affirm that Jesus is our representative, our substitute, our one that was just like us in all ways, yet without sin, and was also God in the flesh your perfect son from eternity, and the one that could pay our debt and pay it to the full, and the one that had the unique resources and the unique ability to do so. We love him. Father, we love you because you first loved us, sending your son to retrieve lost sheep. So let us once again enter through that door and enjoy fellowship and worship and in song with you again today. In Christ's name, amen.